Hello children and welcome to Kids Storytime. Our story for today is about the ten plagues. These were ten plagues that ravaged the land of Egypt as the Lord was preparing to deliver the Israelites from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Now if you remember from the last story, the Lord you know, called Moses through the burning bush and told him what he wanted Moses to do. That was to go to Egypt, go to Pharaoh, and lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And in today's story, we're going to see how Moses does that. And I'm pretty sure all of you children have heard this story at some point or the other. So it's, it's definitely a story that you're very familiar with. You'll find this in between the chapters um, 7 and 12 of the book of Exodus. And I would very much encourage you to take your time when you get the opportunity to read through these chapters and see for yourselves uh, what the Lord really does uh, to save the Israelites from the bondage of the Egyptian oppressors. So we'll be watching a short video, and once that's done, we'll jump into a few questions. So here's the video. After meeting with the Israelites to let them know that God had heard their cries and was coming to their rescue, Moses and Aaron delivered God's message to Pharaoh, Let my people go. But Pharaoh refused because God had hardened his heart. Instead of showing mercy, Pharaoh was cruel and made the work and lives of the Hebrew slaves even more difficult than before. The showdown was at hand between God and Pharaoh. Who was the true king? Who was all-powerful? Whose command could not be ignored? God told Moses not to fear, but instead prepare to witness his mighty power as he forced Pharaoh to let his people go. The next morning, Moses again came to Pharaoh, and again Pharaoh refused to let the Hebrew people go. So, at the Lord's command, Moses told Aaron to stretch his staff over the Nile River, and the waters turned to blood, causing the fish to die and the waters to become undrinkable. But Pharaoh's heart hardened further, so God sent a second plague. This time, frogs covered every inch of the land. This became so unbearable that Pharaoh begged Moses and Aaron to make this plague stop. The morning of the following day, Moses returned to Pharaoh and commanded him to let God's people go. And again, Pharaoh refused. God had Aaron strike the dust with his staff, and gnats swarmed the land, covering both people and animals. When Moses came to Pharaoh again the next day, Pharaoh again refused Moses' request to let the people go. In response, God sent a fourth plague, flies. Like a black cloud, flies covered every part of Egypt, except where the Hebrew slaves lived, spoiling the land and entering every Egyptian's house, including Pharaoh's palace. Once again, Pharaoh pleaded with Moses and Aaron to end this plague. God sent Moses to Pharaoh again, but Pharaoh still refused to listen to God. The next day, God sent a severe plague upon the Egyptians that killed their donkeys, camels, herds, and flocks. This hardened Pharaoh's heart even more against God. Again, God sent Moses to Pharaoh. When Pharaoh refused God's command yet again, Moses threw soot into the air, and it became dust that covered the land of Egypt causing all the people in Egypt to break out into painful sores. Pharaoh's heart, hardened by God, made it so he continued to disobey God's command to let the Hebrew people go. 
God told Moses to go back to Pharaoh and warn him that the coming plagues would be much more destructive and harsh than the last. But Pharaoh still wouldn't listen. When Moses stretched his hand toward heaven, God sent a hailstorm unlike any that had ever been seen before in the land. It destroyed plants and homes and killed animals and people. Pharaoh confessed that he was wrong, but again his heart hardened and he rejected God's command. Then God sent a plague of locusts. These insects covered the land and devoured the last remaining plants and trees in Egypt, leaving the once lush farmland surrounding the Nile a barren desert wasteland. Pharaoh was still unwilling to release God's people, so at God's command, Moses stretched his hand up to the sky, and a heavy darkness swallowed Egypt. For three days, no Egyptian saw another person or left their house. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron so he could try to make a deal to end the plague of darkness. Pharaoh said everyone could go to worship the Lord if all the Hebrew people left their flocks and herds behind. When Moses and Aaron refused this offer, Pharaoh commanded them never to come back or they would be killed. With the people still enslaved, God told Moses there would be one final plague, a plague so severe, Pharaoh would have no choice but to free God's people. God told Moses that throughout the land of Egypt, every firstborn boy would die. God told Moses to tell the Hebrews to cover the doorposts of their homes with the blood of a lamb, and God would pass over their homes. At midnight, the firstborn sons in every Egyptian household died, including Pharaoh's own son. From the lowliest of servants to Pharaoh's palace, there was no home in Egypt untouched by death. This plague so devastated the land of Egypt that Pharaoh commanded God's people to leave. The Hebrews, who had been in slavery for generations, had been set free. All right, so um, before we go to the, the questions, I just wanted to do a quick recap of all the 10 different plagues that the Lord allowed on the land of Egypt. The first was the plague of blood. The second was the plague of frogs. Then came the gnats, which were like insects or bugs. Then came flies. And the next was the death of the Egyptian livestock. The sixth was the plague of boils. Then came hail, uh, hailstones raining down on everything uh, that the Egyptians owned. And then came the locusts. And after that was the plague of darkness. And finally came the plague of the firstborn uh, of every Egyptian household and every Egyptian you know, cattle or animal. All right, so let's um, get started. And the first question is, uh, when Moses asked Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, what did he do? Now, like we saw in the earlier story, God wanted Moses to go to Egypt and ask Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. And Moses is faithful to obey God. He comes here and does exactly what God wants him to do. And what happens? So go ahead, pause the video, and then come back into the answers. Right. So like you would have um, said, um, Pharaoh declined. Pharaoh immediately said no when Moses asked for him to leave the Israelites, let them go to their land and worship God. Uh, Pharaoh immediately declined. He said that is not going to happen. And instead, he, he went further than that. And he said, you know what? Just because you came and asked me, I'm going to make life even more difficult for the Israelites. So up until now, the Israelites had to slave and make a lot of bricks for the Egyptians. The Egyptians were building a lot of buildings and monuments. So these Israelites were, were slaved and you know they were kind of tasked to, to build 
tons and tons of bricks. And now what Pharaoh was going to do was he said, we're not going to provide the Israelites with raw materials like straw, and water and everything that is needed to make clay. And instead, uh, the Israelites will have to find clay, will have to find straw, they will have to find the raw materials themselves. And on top of that, make the bricks. So he made it clear that he wasn't pleased with this ask from Moses and that he was going to make life so difficult for the Israelites than it already was. Right, our next question. Um, so this is something important. Uh, who hardened Pharaoh's heart and why? So we, we read this through the stories and we would have seen it in the video as well. So think about the answers and come up with what you think and then you can come back and join the video again. Right, so the answer here is that it was God who hardened Pharaoh's heart. Um, and, and the reason God did that was so that God could display his power and might in delivering the Israelites. You know, God could have made Pharaoh to immediately agree to, uh, to Moses' demand and let the Israelites go. But the Lord intentionally allowed Pharaoh's heart to be hardened so that the way that the Lord was you know, going to deliver the Israelites out of the land of Egypt would be a mighty, powerful and spectacular way of deliverance that would showcase to the Israelites how much the Lord loved them. How much the Lord cared for them and it's a it's a reminder to see how God is keen to express his love to show his love to the Israelites and that's something that I'm reminded of you know even though um, things may look difficult in in certain aspects of our circumstances we might have people who deal with us a little hardly who deal with us in in roughness and unkind ways and we can be reminded that the Lord is allowing all of that because he wants to show his power, his might, his amazing way of sustaining us, even when things appear to be difficult on the outside. Right, our next question. So we, we saw about the, the 10 different plagues that came upon the land of Egypt one after the other. And my question here is, did these plagues affect the Israelites? Because obviously the Israelites were living in Egypt at that point. Um, so what do you think? You know, did, did the Israelites get affected by these plagues? Pause the video, think about your answers and come back again once you're done. Right, so the amazing thing that we see in all these 10 plagues is how the Lord was sovereign to keep the Israelites safe from all the plagues, even though they lived in the same land of Egypt. Every time there was a plague that you know, impacted the Israelites, sorry, impacted the Egyptians, the Lord made it, you know, made sure that the Israelites were not troubled by it, and not, not even their livestock. And we can see how God was sovereign to do this, how God was, was careful and powerful to do this. And it's a tremendous encouragement for us because we live in a world where there is so much of wickedness, there's so much of evil. And uh, you know, we can, we can choose to, to be like the Israelites. We can choose to live for God, live to you know, honor Him and fear of Him. And the Lord can move in amazing ways to keep us safe, to keep us from harm, to keep us from evil that may be rampant in the world. And that's a picture that we can remember how God kept the Israelites safe. So we see how the Lord you know, kept the Israelites and their livestock and everything they had safe from all the plagues that, that ravaged the land of Egypt. All right, our fourth question. Um, so as things got, you know, worse and worse, you know, it started with the first plague and, you know, the second plague and then the third plague. And each time uh, Pharaoh would, you know, when the plague came upon the land, Pharaoh would relent. He would say, all right, Moses, I can't take this anymore. Um, pray to God and make sure that the, that the plague stops and you can go home and you know, go to your land and, and worship God the way you want. 
and Moses would pray and uh, the plague would stop. And as soon as the plague stopped, Pharaoh would harden his heart again and he would say, no, you can't leave. And then the next plague would come. And the same cycle of you know Pharaoh hardening his heart and then asking Moses to pray that the plague would stop and then again hardening his heart this kept going on and on and on for you know all those plagues one by one and finally the Lord told Moses you know I'm gonna now send the tenth plague and this is going to be it but before this plague comes upon the land I need the Israelites to do something to save themselves from the last plague. Now, up until now, the Israelites didn't have to do anything. They just, you know, went by their own lives and did whatever they were doing. But for the tenth one, they had to do something. So, what did the Israelites have to do to save themselves, uh, you know, from the last plague, literally? So again, pause the video and think about your answers and come back and join again. Right, so for the last plague, they had to do something special. The first thing was they had to have a Passover feast. You know, they had to prepare unleavened bread and they had to, you know, slaughter a lamb. Every family had to do it. They had to get a lamb, slaughter the lamb, and take the blood of that lamb and, you know, put it on the doorposts of their house. And this would be an indicator for that tenth plague to not enter into the house of these Israelites. And this symbolizes something for us in, in our time today. You know, that blood that these Israelites put symbolizes the blood of Christ. You know, without what Jesus did on the cross for us, without that blood that he shed on the cross for you and me, there is no way that we can stand before God and even have a word to utter before Him. You know, the best of us children, the best of us are sinners in the eyes of God. The best of us, we, we might think, I'm better than my friends at school, I'm better than, uh, you know, um, other people in the world. But even the best of us, when we stand in the eyes of God, when we stand before God, we are sinners. Everyone has sinned like we, you know, read in the scriptures. And the only way that we can stand before God and have a relationship with God is through what Jesus did on the cross for us. And that's what symbolizes, you know, uh, this picture here. The Israelites had to use the blood of the lamb and post it on their doorpost to, to redeem themselves, to, to make sure that they were not killed. And it's the same with us. It is only through the blood of the Lamb, through the blood of Jesus, that we can escape the price that we need to pay for our sins, which is eternity in hell. And it is only because of what Jesus did on the cross that we have the ability to have a relationship with God and the hope of having an eternity in heaven with the Lord. Um, and that's something that we can uh, we can remember to to keep in mind uh, that the price that Jesus paid on the cross should never be in vain in our lives. You know, the more we grow and the more we understand the truths of the Bible, it should bring in us a greater and greater reverence and a greater and greater revelation of what God did on that cross for us and what He did on that cross for us was out of love. And the more we understand what he did on that cross for us, the more we will understand his love for us. All right, um, the next question. What was the last plague after which Pharaoh changed his heart? I think it's pretty obvious, but anyways, go ahead, pause the video, think about your answer, and uh, come back once you're done. Right, so like we probably saw in the video and um, also we, we've probably you know uh, known by now that the last plague was the plague of um, you know the death of the firstborn so that meant every firstborn child of any Egyptian family uh, was killed 
this was not just limited to to the to the egyptian people but also to the livestock that the egyptians owned and you can imagine how how widespread that this would have been you know from the firstborn of pharaoh and his household to the firstborn of pharaoh's servants every household the firstborn child of that house um, you know was was taken out taken away in, in, in a sense they died and that was the the plague that came upon the land of egypt you know at the end and this was you know kind of this was too much for pharaoh this was too much for the egyptians and this was the the you know the the final plague or the final act that made pharaoh to kind of give up his way and say i can't take it anymore I, I want to let the Egyptians, sorry, the Israelites go away. So he, he calls Moses and tells him, I'm done with you guys. I need you to leave, leave away from me before I change my mind. Uh, but I'm done with you. And uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure this would have been, you know, terribly hard for, for Pharaoh. Because up until now, all these plagues didn't hurt home or didn't hit him home. But when he had to lose his son. when he saw death and suffering in his own household we see how things changed for him and we could still see you know how the lord had you know planned all of this in his infinite wisdom one after the other the lord took things you know up and up and up and finally it came to a point where pharaoh was was thoroughly broken and we see how he let the israelites go right now this is an interesting question um you know when the israelites finally left what did they what did they leave with they did something the lord actually told the israelites to do something before they left egypt so if you can think about it what was it that the lord told them to do and what did they leave with at the end so pause the video think about your answers and come back and join again right um so the israelites obviously they they left with their families and the livestock and everything that they had but they also did something very specific the lord had told them to go to their egyptian friends and neighbors and people who who lived near them and he told them go and borrow as much as you can gold silver clothing and anything of value borrow from them and it's amazing to see how the lord moved in these egyptian people to be open hearted to give to these israelites who came to ask and borrow gold and silver and 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 you know valuable items from their home and the egyptians you know gave as much as you know they had and the israelites when they left the land of egypt they took away with them all these gold and silver and you know everything of value that they had borrowed from the egyptians they took away with them and on the face of it it might look you know wasn't this a little unfair but we'll actually see how the lord was dealing in fairness uh we 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 will actually know you know if you look at the the book of genesis and eventually exodus you will see that the uh, egyptians had oppressed the israelites for nearly 430 years so for for about 400 years the egyptians were treating the israelites as slaves now when you are someone's slave you don't get paid for it we don't have slaves or most of the countries don't have slaves anymore right now but in the olden days when there were people who had slaves working for them those slaves were not entitled for a pay or a salary they would just have to work as hard as they could do whatever their master told them to do the master would probably give them a little bit of food just so that they could keep themselves alive but the slaves had no right to earn or you know own property or you know have any kind of possessions to themselves and that's what happened for 400 years the israelites were treated as slaves they were not paid for all their hard work and all their hard labor and we see finally when the lord chooses to deliver the israelites he is judging them he is judging the egyptians in a sense uh, he is paying back the israelites what was due unto them and that is why he caused the egyptians to look 
favorably upon the Israelites, giving them the gold and silver and clothing. And when they left Egypt, they pretty much left with everything that was valuable in Egypt. And this is a, a reminder to us that God is a just God. Even though we may live in a world which is unjust, you know, we may do our best at work, we may do our best at school, and yet we may probably not be fairly treated. We may not be getting what probably is rightfully ours. And it may seem to be an unjust world that we live in. But we can remember that God is sovereign. No matter what may happen in the world, the Lord is still seated on the throne. And He can make sure and make ways uh, to, to ensure that whatever is, is ours or whatever is, is something that we should have had, you know, He can make ways and move in wonderful ways to make sure that, that justice is served and that we get what is rightfully ours or what we you know, rightfully deserve. And it's, it's interesting to see how the Lord was careful to, to pay back the Israelites for all their hard work. Uh, even though the Egyptians didn't do that, the Lord was sovereign to do it. Our final question uh, for the story is, um, you know, like all of you would agree, this is probably one of the most amazing stories and, you know, uh, the awe-inspiring stories of the scripture when you go through all the ten plagues and see all that, you know, God had to do to the Egyptians to save them from, or to save the Israelites from the Egyptians. So what does this deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt mean for us today? What is, what is the relevance of the story for us today? You can definitely take your time, think about what this story means for us today, and <clears throat> come back and join the, uh, the video again. Right. So like the Israelites who were enslaved by the Egyptians and they cried out to God, they cried out to God for deliverance and the Lord delivered them, we too must seek to be delivered from the slavery to sin. You know, all of us, uh, you know, we, we definitely have certain areas where we continue to sin, where we struggle, where we want to be delivered. And if we don't have a desperate cry to be delivered from those you know sins in our lives the lord is not going to intervene but if we like the israelites cry out to the lord cry out day and night and say lord i want to be delivered from this sin whether it is telling lies whether it is being angry whether it is worrying whether it, whether it is having bad thoughts or lustful thoughts whatever it may be if we are desperate like the Israelites were to be saved from the slavery, if we are desperate, the Lord is able to save us from slavery to sin. I want to bring out a couple of uh, verses. You know, Romans chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Sin shall not be a master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So this is the first question I want you children to ask yourself, are you a slave to sin or are you a master over sin? If you are a slave to sin or if you are still, you know, bondaged to sin, that means we are still not under grace but under a law. And that is where we need to cry out. We need to cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your grace. I need your strength. I need the power of your Holy Spirit to overcome sin. You know, many times we can think that the law can deliver us from sin. The law is nothing but the Word of God that tells us what is right and what is wrong. And every one of us, when we sin, we know that it is wrong. When we tell a lie, we know that it is wrong. When we, you know, have a bad thought in our mind, we know that it is wrong. When we get angry, we know that it is wrong. But that very knowledge of the law does not deliver us from sin. We need something more, and that is God's grace. Grace is God's power that He gives to us that helps us overcome sin. So the next time we are tempted to lust, or tempted to be angry, or tempted to tell a lie, 
we can ask for God's grace to not do that sin or be part of that sin and instead be overcomers, be free from the bondage of that sin in our life. And that's something that we can take from this lesson. If we are desperate in our cry, in our lives to be saved from sin, God is faithful to do amazing things, just like he did uh, you know, with, with the Egyptians, um, just like the wonderful and miraculous things that he did in, you know, to the Egyptians to save the Egyptians from, to save the Israelites from slavery. God is able to do amazing things, powerful things, to save us from the bondage of sin. And he does that by filling our lives with the Holy Spirit and giving us grace. And I would encourage you children to ask God for this Holy Spirit. We don't have to become adults. We don't have to wait a certain number of years. We can ask God for the power of the Holy Spirit. However young or old or however much you've known the Bible, we can still ask God for this power in our lives. All right, I'll close with the usual credits. The pictures we saw from today were from freebibleimages.org and the video we saw earlier was from Share Faith Kids. And um, all the story points and the key lessons that I've taken away from the story are from teachings of Brother Zach. Uh, you can go to the website cfcindia.com to uh, hear more messages from him. I would encourage you to go through a series called Through the Bible. It's a one-hour exposition of every book in the Bible by Brother Zach, and it brings out so much of meaning of every book in the Bible and the context and relevance uh, it has to us in our day-to-day -day lives. Thank you, and God bless you.